Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Uh, in this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologer Nina Griffin about the 17th century astrologer William Lilly and his work or his book on astrology titled Christian Astrology, which is one of the first ang- English language textbooks on astrology. Uh, this episode is recorded on Sunday, September 8th, 2019, uh, starting at 4 16 p.m. in Denver, Colorado. And this is the 221st episode of the show. Uh, for more information about how to subscribe to the podcast and help support the production of future episodes by becoming a patron, please visit theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. Hey, Nina, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Chris. All right. So this is a big topic. We're going to be talking about the life and work of William Lilly, who um, was easily the most prominent astrologer of the 17th century, but also had a huge impact on later traditions of astrology because he wrote what was essentially the first major textbook on astrology in the English language. And this is somebody whose work you've really um, focused on and come to specialize in to a large extent, right? Yes, that's correct. I have studied with Deborah Holding and John Frawley, both of whom, as we will later uh, discuss, come out of the Olivia Barclay lineage, who of course is very tied into William Lilly. And it's been a big part of my own study and learning of astrology as well. Okay, brilliant. So, um, in terms of Lilly, what was his dates and like time frame? Like, what years did he live and die? Sure. So, Lilly had a particularly long life by 17th century standards. He, of course, was born in England, and he was born in 1602 and died in 1681. Okay. So, pretty much the entirety or the greater part of the 17th century pretty much encapsulates his life. That's right. All right. And um, he was not just like a theoretical astrologer, but he was actually a practicing astrologer who lived in London and saw clients on a regular basis, right? Yes, that is correct. So he was not originally from London, and we'll talk a little bit about his bio later. But William Lilly really saw a number of clients every day. And we know this not only because of his own and contemporaries' accounts, but also because he had his own uh, case books that he kept. So whenever a client would come see him, typically about a horary uh, chart, that is when we'll talk about more about what that is, but he would write down the chart, the client's name, and the question and answer that he gave. And these case books uh, are still preserved. Again, we'll, we'll discuss a little more about that later. But we have really good records of how many clients he saw, how often, what his typical day even looked like, just based on these contemporaneous diaries. Okay, brilliant. And what he became the most known for, especially in subsequent generations, was this big uh, textbook on astrology that he wrote titled Christian Astrology, right? That's right. And Christian Astrology is interesting because not only is it a very big book with a lot of pages and a lot of information, but it's also the first um, real astrological textbook written in English. Prior to his time, all astrological works were written in Latin. Okay, so that in Latin was like the educated language in Europe that most like scientific and other types of texts were written in up to that point. That's right. It was really the language of the sciences, and astrology being one of the sciences was, of course, written in Latin so that people from all different kinds of countries could read it and have a conversation about it. So why did he decide to write his his book, his major treatment of astrology in English at that point instead of? continuing the tradition of writing it in Latin, where it would have been more accessible to, let's say, people in other countries? I think there were a couple of things going on. One is he himself was actually quite excellent in Latin, perhaps better than most of his astrological contemporaries. And again, this is part of sort of the interesting aspects of his life. But I think he recognized that because very few people were very good at Latin, um, they really were not able to perfect their knowledge of astrology because a lot of the texts, even though they may have been available to them, were simply not very accessible because of the lack of Latin learning. So I think he wanted people to really know astrology and he wanted to be able to essentially condense and translate what he knew from all these Latin texts into one vernacular text that would be accessible to a much larger audience. Okay. Um, yeah, so he, I mean, one of the things in reading Christian astrology is he really comes off like a, like a teacher, somebody that has a genuine interest in teaching, and that was probably part of his 
you know, goal or motivation in writing in English was that part of him that really wanted to help everybody to learn basically this subject. I think that's right. And, you know, one of his, I think, ongoing issues had been that the standard for the practice of astrology was not necessarily very high, or at least it was very uneven, pretty much just depending on the level of education of the particular practitioner. And in those days, not many people had much education as it was a as sort of a luxury commodity. So I think he wanted to make good astrology available to all. Okay. And what kind of influence did he have? Because it seems like after he wrote his text, was his, I, sometimes um, this trips me up how to frame it, whether it was the first English, English text on astrology ever, or was it the first major textbook on astrology? Because there were other sort of shorter books in English prior to Lily's, right? So I'm only aware of one other work prior to his on astrology in English. Mm -hmm. So if you know of others, I'm happy to be corrected. But in my research, I've only come across one. And that was a, a short treatise on medical astrology that was sort of pseudonymously published by somebody, I think he called himself the initials GC Gentleman. So it was sort of a odd, maybe half-hearted attempt to put astrology out there, but only one aspect of it, medical. Certainly nothing of the scope that Lily was contemplating. Okay, sure. Yeah, I've only found like one other, it was like a very short book that was a more like an almanac or a prediction about an upcoming Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that was in English, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like a textbook in astrology. And that's why right. I feel like we can say with some certainty that this is the first major English language textbook on astrology. But then after that point, it seems like he influenced a number of other people, and this started a trend of astrology books being written in English, right? I think that's right. And we certainly have a number of authors uh, flourishing uh, contemporaneously and after him who were just wrote in English. Okay. So who were some of the other astrologers that started writing English language, like major astrological text after Lily? So we have quite a few. We have uh, Nicholas Culpepper, who wrote uh, medical uh, about medical astrology because he was a physician as well as an astrologer. We have John Gadbury, uh, William Ramsey, uh, Joseph Blagrave. There were quite a few others. Um, a number of them, like Lily himself, were not just astrologers, but they were they were on a particular side of the English Civil War. And so they were often engaged in a war of printed matter and a war of words with Lily um, if they were on the opposite side, publishing almanacs and predictions that contradicted each other and where they attacked each other personally and so on. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of funny like bickering and back and forth between the astrologers in the 17th century that's somewhat occasionally like entertaining to watch and other times is kind of like sort of you're rolling your eyes seeing the sort of squabbling between some of them. That's right. A little cringy sometimes. Right. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned the date, but what was the, the publication date for Christian astrology? So Christian astrology actually came out twice. And there aren't, there's not a huge difference between the two. So the first edition was 1647. Okay. And the second edition was 1659. And okay. as I understand it, there isn't a big difference between the two. I think he basically corrected some errata from the first printing. Um, and so it's not exactly a second printing in 1659, but it's uh, it's pretty close to one. There aren't major editorial changes or anything like that. Okay. So 1647, that becomes then an important like date for us to remember of the first major English language text on astrology. And then not long after that, within just a few years, we start seeing a bunch of these other English language texts on astrology start to appear as well by some of those figures you mentioned, like Gadbury and Ramsey and so on and so forth. That's right. Okay. All right. So that's an important turning point. Um, other publications later in his life, he also translated uh, Anima Astrology or An Astrologer's Guide in 1676, uh, right? He did. And the, the Anima Astrologiae, which is this, like, he called it a guide for astrologers, um, he, it was basically translated by, uh, by his student or he not exactly adopted son, but kind of like an amanuensis, Henry Coley. And it included, uh, it included material from Guido Bonatti's Book of Astronomy, as well as Jerome Cardano's book. 
And so it's sort of a, a book of aphorisms and guidance that Lily thought was especially helpful. And Lily provided the foreword to it. So sometimes it's, um, it's listed under his name, although Coley really did the translation. Okay, got it. And <clears throat> for that, people can actually go back and listen to episode 108, which was your, your previous appearance on the podcast where we talked about Benati's um, aphoris- book of aphorisms and sort of touched on Coley's translation of that as well, right? That's exactly right. So this is something that happens a few centuries later. And it's again, it's for the first time available in English. Sure. So after that point, um, after Lily died eventually, he continued to be highly influential in the astrological tradition because his text in various forms continued to be sort of drawn on or, or continued to influence other later traditions of astrology, especially in English, right? That's right. And it's sort of interesting, Chris, because one of the things that is sort of an interesting game that you can play is when you start looking at 18th and 19th century astrological texts, many of which borrow from Lily to a larger or lesser extent. And so in a way, the the 17th century astrology of, of Lily's day continued to live on many hundreds of years later, often in uncredited, essentially plagiarisms, in various astrology books published later. Right. Um, all the way through to the 20th century, even though the original text of Lily didn't necessarily survive, or at least wasn't widely available until relatively recently. That's exactly right. All right. Um, so aside from publishing Christian Astrology, which was his major textbook on astrology, he was also in, heavily involved in, and during his day was probably even perhaps more well known for publishing almanacs, right? That's right. And that was probably a significant moneymaker for him in a couple of different ways. So he published, my records here say, 36 years of annual almanacs. And we'll talk a little bit more about the contents of those later. But he published them starting in 1647, which again, important year for him, Christian astrology first came out. And he published them until 1682. Okay, so that's a lot of work for 36 years in publishing almanacs. And he actually became um, the best selling almanac writer for a period in England during that time in the mid 17th century, right? That's right. I think by a long shot. I don't know if we have comparative numbers for the other authors, but um, he, he sold um, you know, as much as 30,000 pieces of these almanacs per year, which I think would be a pretty good number even today for a relatively niche topic. But back then in England, with a much smaller population than we see today, that's pretty impressive. Right. So what did these almanacs contain, or why were they so popular? Like, what did they even cover? I think there were a couple of things going on. So they contained, you know, as you can imagine, weather predictions, sort of the mainstay of, mainstay of almanacs. But what was very important is that they also contained significant amounts of political predictions uh, with respect to England and other countries. Now, the reason that political predictions were so popular, even though I think they're almost always popular, is because the English Civil War and the very difficult aftermath was basically happening during, during most of, of you know, Lily's life, essentially. There was always something related to the Civil War. Uh, and he, because of this, because of the intense, um, obviously, anxiety and upheaval that was happening in England at that time for many, many years... People were very eager to read these almanacs to understand which way the wind might blow next year. Okay. So it contained not just like weather predictions, but also political predictions and other um, sort of discursions into different areas or different topics. That's right. And occasionally he would write, um, you know, he would put in some astrological sort of teaching in there. It wasn't the, the large sum of it, so I don't want to overstate the importance of it, but. Every now and then he might put in something from Ptolemy, like different effects of eclipses and different decans and things like that. Okay. And um, so this is really important because I was reading that how the laws had changed where um, there had been anti-astrology laws for quite a while on the books up to that point, but then shortly before Lily sort of came onto the scene and became prominent, part of the reason he became prominent with his almanac is he was able to I don't know if exploit is the right term, but he was able to take advantage of like an opening where suddenly the press was more free for a period of time, and he was able to sort of get away with publishing these almanacs and making these political predictions without as much 
um, issue with the government or the authorities as he might have had up to that point? That's right. You know, politically, what was going on in England um, that led up to the Civil War was that the King Charles I was extremely repressive. And um, maybe you know this, but he essentially shut down Parliament for 11 years. Um, obviously, a, you know, that was considered a very dictatorial move because the Parliament was where the people, to some extent, had a voice. And uh, so for him to shut that down, uh, that was just one of the ways in which he uh, tried to squash dissent. And over the long term, it didn't work out for him. But uh, that the censorship of the press um, and the, the prohibition of, of anything like a political prediction or anything like an almanac would definitely have been part of that. Okay. So maybe let's expand on that a little bit in terms of the political situation in England at that time, just for those that aren't familiar where there were those tensions between those two sides, between like the king and his supporters and the parliament and their supporters, right? That's exactly right. And I think when we're, we're talking about polarization of the political and national body, it was very extreme in mo during most of the 17th century in England. And it took a number of years for it to work itself out. And in many ways, it, it continued even after Lily's death. In other forms, but uh, but yes, you basically had even the astrological community divide itself into two camps: the royalists and the parliament supporters. On the other hand, Lily was on the parliament side, so you might say on the side of the people, and so many of the predictions that he published um, in these almanacs and through other means were very much supportive of parliament, and so were considered to be propagandist. Okay. Yeah, because they were against the king, or for the most part, they tended to be against the king. That's right. Okay. Um, so what was the loophole then if, if there was such an extreme um, sort of ban or, or so much censor censorship on astrology up until a certain point? What happened that suddenly made it so that he could start issuing political predictions like that through his almanacs? Well, the political climate had changed because, as you know, of course, the, the English Civil War started to try to overthrow the king and the entire country was thrown into chaos. So at some point, the laws changed, perhaps in an effort to appease people, you know, to try to kind of manage the situation a little bit and loosen the reins. And that's the void that Lily jumped into with his almanacs. I'm sure other people had thought of doing that before him, but he was very well positioned to do so, uh, having already built up quite a reputation as a, as a practicing astrologer. Okay. So, and, and his, one of his most famous predictions that appeared in one of his almanacs was of the Great Fire of London of 1666, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And he predicted it well in advance in 1652 in a pamphlet that wasn't an almanac. It was called Monarchy or No Monarchy, which again, as you can tell from the title, deals with, you know, should we have a king? Should we have a parliament? What does a republic look like? You know, consider that they were in England, they were really wrestling with issues that other European countries hadn't really dealt with uh, so extensively or at all for the most part. So he was, you know, he's trying to say, of course, you know, monarchy is not necessary and here are the bad things that are going to happen to, to the monarchy as well. And, but in, in this document, he doesn't just make predictions about the king, but he also has this very strange um, engraving or hieroglyph as it's been called that if you look at it symbolically portrays uh potentially the symbol for the city of London, which is twins because London is thought to be under Gemini, and a fire and certain other characters that look like they could be planets. And so it's thought that this was a, a prediction of the eventual fire of London, which occurred 14 years later and burned down so much of that city. Okay. And he actually got in trouble for that to some extent or almost did, right? He did. I think, you know, it was later found and, you know, that you know, it wasn't arson that started the, the Great Fire. It's just the things that happened in a 17th century city where most things are built of wood and, you know, there's just not really great fire safety and maybe not really great fire um, extinguishing uh, apparatus available. But of course, the way that people are, they're always looking for a culprit. And so a number of people got hauled into court um, and he was one of them because how could you possibly know so far in advance that a great fire would consume the city? Right. So they accused him of setting the fire, but that accusation was eventually dismissed. That's exactly right. Okay. 
Um, and going back to the political situation, um, there, it seemed like there was some ambiguity in his biography because occasionally it seemed like he tried to do things that were helpful towards the king, um, right? Or, or there were some instances where there was some ambiguity about what his his full stance was. Yes, I think in general his his role is is a little bit blurry, and of course that's intentional because. To take a step back, a lot of the information that we have about Lily's life came from his autobiography, which he wrote toward the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And by the time he wrote it, the the monarchy was restored in England. Uh, Charles' son was brought from exile to be the next king. And so suddenly all the people like Lily, who had been very vocal on the parliamentarian side, found themselves in the very awkward and dangerous situation of having to justify or soften some of the anti-monarchist uh, statements that they had made in the preceding years. So often in his biography, I think when he had the opportunity to say something positive about the king and to minimize his own involvement in the parliamentary cause, he took it. But you know, the other side of it too, Chris, is that I think he really did try to, as far as we know, he really did work for clients on both sides. And there are a number of cases that we know of where the king's very close supporters came to Lily to try to get advice, even as the king was essentially being imprisoned, to see if they could help the king escape and so on. So there are cases where, as far as we know, he gave honest advice, although it's not clear his advice was taken seriously given his his partisan background. Right. He was somehow involved in almost helping the king to escape at one point from prison. He was, and there's a very curious incident that I, I, you know, it's it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, hidden, obviously, just because there aren't a lot of witnesses to it, and everybody later tried to sort of change their um, change their stance as to the situation. But uh, he did advise a woman named uh, Jane Horwood, who was one of the king's confidants, and she helped him. She tried to help the king make an escape from one of the palaces or, or castles where he was being held. Um, you know, before he got put into prison, it wasn't like they took the king and put him directly in jail. There was a long intermediate period where they're kind of putting him from one place to another. They're moving him around and they're maybe moving him to more secure locations. So the situation was very fluid. And so one of his supporters, uh, you know, came to Lily and said, okay, where, you know, when should the king escape and what direction should he go? And apparently Lily did advise some very specific, um, based on, I assume, a horary chart, some very specific locations where the king could go. But, you know, and I assume she relayed that information to the king, but it's not clear that the king felt at all safe taking that advice from Lily. Okay. So the advice wasn't necessarily taken. And eventually this entire um, scene culminates with the king, with Charles actually being executed, right? That's exactly right. So of course, Charles I was was a king who was executed uh, by, you know, partly he had tried to escape and the situation just kind of, um, you know, it got more and more fraught. There was really, I think partly where the king placed himself, he was very, just as a personality, he was very uncompromising. And so he didn't leave himself a lot of room to exit the situation gracefully. I think instead he he was very entitled and very imperious to the end. And so it just drove this dynamic with Parliament where they felt that the only way to really get him out of the way um, was to execute him. And there are some rumors or guesses or conjectures about Lily maybe being involved in timing that execution. Um, and it's entirely possible, but of course, we don't really have any direct evidence because if we did, then Lily probably would have been executed um, once the restoration occurred. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember. I, th- I thought I read in Holden's um, master's thesis that he almost, that Lily seemed startled by the execution or something or felt that it went too far, but I don't know if I'm remembering that correctly. Yes, I think there was something like that there. Um, on the other hand, there is some evidence that that he was called to, um, that Lily was called to a meeting with a couple of the men who essentially had made, you know, who were powerful in the parliamentary cause and had made a decision to um, you know, kind of what happened to the king. And he they he was asked to bring a couple of the pages of an almanac with him. So there is some sense that maybe he was asked as to timing or, you know, he was being asked to advise, okay, if we were going to do an execution, when is the right time to do this so that, you know, things go the way that we had planned? Sure. So um, Lily, part of like all of this that's really interesting is just 
how involved politically he was and that he had he was seeing clients who were politically powerful people from both sides during the course of this civil war but sometimes occasionally it seems like several times throughout the course of his life as a result of like knowing people in high places he was occasionally able to get out of trouble as a result of that and really lucked out several times where somebody else who wasn't as well connected might have ended up in jail or or worse i think that's right of course the paradox of it is that you know it's those connections that probably it's some other high level connections that got him in trouble to begin with so maybe if he wasn't very connected he wouldn't have been hauled up but that did happen during the restoration. He was called before court um, a couple of times. And of course, that could mean execution. And it would also mean likely forfeiture of his entire estate and assets. And so luckily, in both cases, he had friends who were able to vouch for him and just show that whatever people were trying to drum up, um, because obviously he was a known anti-monarchist, his words were in print, so he couldn't really deny that. Um, so he had friends who were able to essentially vouch for him and, and sort of wind his way out of some of these accusations. Okay. So, I mean, let's take a step back because like reading and learning about all of this, it's just so bizarre how prominent Lily was, how well connected he was, and how involved in the politics of his day he was. And part of it was just because he was taking advantage of, or he was in the right place at the right time to take full advantage of like a new um, communication medium, which was the ability to rapidly distribute um, you know, information through these printed almanacs, and that that had become a new sort of source of where people were getting their information and how people were being influenced in terms of their political views and things like that at the time. And he happened to be just incredibly well positioned in terms of that to some extent. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Okay. So th that's interesting. It's just a repeating phenomenon that I see with astrologers at different points in history where they tend to be often people that are at the forefront of new advancements in technology and communication and as a result of that are often like taking advantage of those things in order to promote astrology and and use it for astrological purposes and in order to communicate with the public and lily is definitely a, a really great example of that that's exactly right and you know it's one of those things where it was sort of a double edged sword right he took advantage of this great medium that perhaps wasn't available before but it also placed him in a lot of danger later in his life when the political climate changed. Right. I feel like a modern analogy might be like blogging or something 10 years ago, or maybe doing podcasts in this decade. It's like That's if right. Lily was alive now, he would be doing a podcast. It would be like <laughs> his monthly almanac. And just imagine if that had become a really successful podcast and that he eventually got involved on a high level with having different political contacts and even influenced what was going on with like let's say the white house to some extent that would be almost like the modern analogy of what he was doing or his role in society in the 17th century i think that's right now i think on top of that imagine something like the american civil war happening in the background and you have sort of a an american version of maybe what he was experiencing right and you just have this astrologer who is sort of connected to both sides and who's being seen by important people from both sides who are actually in some instances taking his advice for major steps in in the process or major decisions that they're they're taking. That's exactly right. And like I said, it's a double-edged sword, you know, once the political climate changes. Right. All right. So I think that gives a good context for like his life and times in terms of his political involvement. Uh, let's go back and talk more about his astrological textbook, though, Christian Astrology, and talk a little bit about the scope and contents of the work. So yes. uh, Christian Astrology is divided into three books, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So it is three books. It was published as two volumes. So book one is the basics of astrology. It's got your signs, houses, the meaning of planets, just various astrological concepts, planetary motion, things like that. Then book two, he goes directly into horary astrology questions, and that book is organized by house or generally the kinds of questions that would be associated with a given house. Although there are some cases where, you know, something might be, let's say a third house, it might be in the third house chapter, but it's actually that the analysis doesn't really use the third house, but that's, that's a different issue. Um, and then book three deals with natal astrology and the analysis of natal horoscopes, as well as prediction from natal charts. Okay. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that he treats 
horary astrology first in book two, and then he treats natal astrology later. So he gives like a greater precedence to um, horary astrology in that sense in his his textbook. Yes, and I think that's very interesting, and I I can't imagine exactly why that would be, other than it seems that horary astrology was probably the key way that astrology was was practiced in London of his time, partly because horary is so flexible and can answer so many different kinds of questions, but also just from a practical perspective, probably the average client would not have their birth time, and uh, you know it just maybe was not very practical. Also, just the the level of manual effort that was involved if you wanted to predict from a natal chart, you had to write, you had to create a lot of charts. So I think it would have been both practically and financially out of reach for most clients, whereas horary was something that everybody could save up a few, um, you know, whatever it was, whether it was farthings or, or shillings or pounds to, uh, to be seen by an astrologer at that time. Yeah. Well, and it's just a good example of the shifting emphasis of astrology, how much more prominent horary had become by, let's say, the 17th century versus, let's compare it to um, like Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos in the 2nd century, where the first book is introductory material, then the second book is mundane astrology, and then books three and four are natal astrology. Or like Dorotheus in the 1st century, his first book was intro stuff, then there's natal astrology, and then the last book is electional astrology. So it just shows how much things had shifted in this greater emphasis, perhaps in the later part of the tradition by the time of the Renaissance on horary um, over natal astrology to some extent. Yes, that's that's exactly right, Chris. Okay, um, let's see. And then in terms of natal, I've heard it sometimes said by like some people that specialize in Lily that they tend to think that his treatment of horary was better or stronger in some ways than his treatment of natal. Do you feel like that's an accurate statement to make, or is that your your own opinion as well? I think that's right. I mean, don't get me wrong; you could certainly learn a lot about natal astrology from that from his natal book. Um, what's different between the two books is that there aren't as many examples, and okay. so that's really you know one of the exceptional things about the horary novel, uh, the, the horary volume, is that it has a number of examples from his time, from his own practice, sometimes his own personal questions. And that's great because historical textbooks on astrology very rarely had examples that had, especially had a nice narrative that showed you, okay, here was the question, here's what I said, here's what actually happened. And in the natal book, there is a, a nativity that he analyzes and then, you know, he, he does a nice job with it, but you kind of want a little bit more, right? He does predictions with it as well. But I think it's one of those things where he would probably have, if he maybe had more time and more energy he really probably could have filled it out with more examples and and just a richer um you know just a richer text that way right yeah i mean and it's great the with the horary textbook that is the most valuable part is just that he has at least uh one if not more examples for each of the 12 houses as he goes through them and sort of tells you theoretically or abstractly what topics are assigned to that house or what kind of questions you can answer that relate to that house but then he has Actual studies of timed horary charts where he can explain um, what the questions were and then exactly what happened. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. And that's been really useful in modern times as people have started to study um, his textbook and study his work again, is studying his case studies. Although it's funny, like sometimes when astrologers have done that, they sometimes notice differences between, I feel like, like general principles that he lays out versus what he does. In practice, in the examples, and sometimes that creates um, sort of matters of interpretation where people have had debates over, you know, what was his true approach or what approach did he really endorse, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly right. I mean, once you start putting examples out there, in a way, those are what people often take to be the truth because that's a worked example. And it may not always reflect the theory that he is describing in the text itself. Okay, got it. Um, one of the other things I love is really early in book two, when he starts getting into horary and gets into first house questions, in his, I think his first example chart, he does a very detailed analysis of what the questions were and what his delineations were and then what happened. But at the end, he then summarizes it more shortly just to make sure you get the main points. And he really shines through as a, a teacher at that point to me of somebody that really like wants the student to understand and know what the takeaway lesson was from that example. 
I think that's right. And I sometimes I wonder if, if in writing this book, he wrote the book that he wishes he had when he was starting to read about astrology and learn it. Right, right. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And in terms of some of the, um, in the notes, when you talk about the first book, you say that sometimes he took some of his treatment of like the introductory or basic um, material from other authors, or he was heavily influenced by other authors. So he was certainly, I mean, I don't know that he necessarily took it from them, but he, you know, as you know, he did a lot of, of work. Um, he did a lot of work in, in sort of popularizing some of these more obscure Latin texts. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, he, um, I, I, you know, I don't see him copying. I haven't really encountered that, although I suppose I haven't seen all of his primary sources. But he does lean, you know, he does lean on Bonatti and he does lean on Cardano. He loves Nybod, and we can talk about that a little bit later um, because I think Nybod was very influential in his um, in his uh, approach. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, he's he, you can tell he's a very well read um, author who over the course of his years of practice had managed to synthesize a lot of the work that was available out there and to put it into a format that would be easily understandable and digestible by, by a reader. Yeah. Um, and that was really crucial, his role in um, bringing together so many different sources and then synthesizing him, basically all the sources that were available to him up to that point, and then demonstrating his synthesis through the example charts of what his actual working synthesis of the tradition was at that point as a practicing astrologer in London in the mid-17th century. Um, so let's talk about some of his sources for Christian astrology, because uh, he actually includes an extensive bibliography in the text that tells you exactly what books he had access to and which ones he was using, especially for different branches or different pr approaches to astrology. Yes, that's exactly right. So there's a, there's a famous bibliography at the end and there's some debate about whether it reflected just his own library, but I think the best sources seem to say that he probably had a lot of those texts, but he didn't have them all. They were just ones that he had seen in other people's libraries or that he had borrowed or you know that he had access to from other people. Um, however, in the text itself, as he writes, he will sometimes say, you know, um, Al-Bumasar or like the Arabs, or he will refer to particular authors whenever he says, okay, well, they say X and I agree, or he might say, well, they say why, and I disagree because my experience has found something else. So he will right. have this, he will engage in this kind of ongoing dialogue inside the text with the different authors. Right. I love that that he he'll often like state what the tradition says or what the quote unquote the ancient says, but then he will say, but in my experience, you know, this is usually the way that it works out, because that's so much part of the standard model that I see in other earlier authors. As well, where there's always this dialogue throughout the tradition of, you know, reporting what the inherited tradition is, but in some instances modifying that when it doesn't work out in the actual experience of the practitioner. Yes, that's exactly right, and it's very helpful because you can see on the one hand they have a lot of respect for the tradition and they don't want to just make that editorial decision to not tell you what the ancients might say, but at the same time they do feel obligated to editorialize and tell you what they have found. Right. Okay. Um, so in terms of his library um, and in terms of his sources, he seems to have drawn on uh, some Hellenistic sources, some medieval sources, and some Renaissance sources. Um, who were some of his primary sources, if we could make a, like a blanket statement about his entire work? Well, certainly Ptolemy is definitely way up there, and there there are some historical reasons that Ptolemy might be number one versus some of the medieval Arabic authors who were also in, available in translation at the time. Like I said, he speaks very highly of Valentine Nybod, um, and so in his works where Nybod critiques uh, Arabic sources, that's you know potentially a different uh, different discussion, but. Uh, he also leans, of course, heavily on Bonatti, and you know he follows Bonatti's organization um, of his book. And you can sometimes see him quoting Bonatti or referring to Bonatti's uh, horary volume in his own work. And then, of course, uh, Girolamo Cardano, who was a, a major astrological author of the time. Okay. And Valentine Nybod was an astrologer who lived about a century before Lily in the 16th century, what was the thing you were referring to about him critiquing Arabic authors? 
So Naibad wrote a book. He wrote a number of books. He was extremely um, literate and highly, you know, highly uh, uh, well, well read and well written. And Naibad wrote a book called Commentary on Alcabitius. And this is a very important book because in it, he essentially uh, has a, a, a very detailed discussion of, okay, here's why the Arabic medieval authors are wrong in, in specific ways. And Ptolemy is right, because as you can imagine, Ptolemy and the Arabic authors do not always agree on everything. And there are various cultural and, I would say, religious reasons as to why Naibot may have taken the side of Ptolemy. But at the end of this book, which Lily says that it's he's the most profound author he had ever met with, was Naibot, uh, he sees he says that you know really what we need to do is follow Ptolemy and, and it's it's this tradition that is the most important and so I think Lily himself was very influenced by that trend. Yeah, so this is part of like a Renaissance trend of like what's been called the the sort of back to Ptolemy movement where um, there was a lot of Renaissance authors where they inherited the majority of the tradition that they inherited at that point of text written in Latin were like Latin translations of Arabic texts that were written um, between the 8th century and the 12th century. And then a bunch of those were translated into Latin in the 12th century and synthesized. And then that became like the inherited astrological tradition. And a lot of those texts in the early part of that, like the 8th century, were influenced by the works of authors like Dorotheus of Sidon and Vadius Valens to create this own sort of like unique tradition of medieval astrology. Um, but then at some point in the Renaissance, there was this movement to recover the original Greek text of Ptolemy. And once they did that, they realized that there were some major discrepancies between the way Ptolemy practiced astrology versus the way that this other inherited tradition that had come from the Arabic-speaking astrologers, how they were practicing it. And sometimes that created like tensions in trying to figure out how to reconcile those two approaches. I think that's right. And you know, I think also we can't we can't discount the importance of kind of the religious aspect of this too, is that, you know, Europeans were very much inclined to be um, anti-Middle Eastern and anti-Muslim, because don't forget that by Lily's time, and certainly by Naibad's time, there were very significant conflicts and incursions, for example, by the Turks into Europe and a lot of conflicts with, with the Islamic world. And so I think there was a real trend to see, okay, do we, do we really need these guys for our astrology? Right. So that was interesting because that has sometimes really um, important and, and specific impacts on the technical approach to astrology that Lily makes, because oftentimes when there's a conflict in the tradition where there's one approach that's represented by the, the Arabic uh, strand of the tradition versus another approach that's represented by Ptolemy, like he'll tend to side with Ptolemy in pretty much all instances where there's some sort of discrepancy, so that this results in specific things like he'll use um, Ptolemy's approach to the bounds or the terms instead of the Egyptian approach that came from like Dorotheus and Valens and those authors that was then filtered through the medieval tradition, uh, or he'll use Ptolemy's approach to the triplicity rulers instead of the Dorothean approach, or for the calculation of the lot of fortune, he'll default to just using the day formula like Ptolemy says versus re instead of reversing it for day and night charts as the medieval astrologers did following Dorotheus. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly right. And again, I don't know how much of that was his own research that led him to that versus following someone like Nybot who he felt made a very strong case for Ptolemy. Right. Well, so let's talk about that because that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's like one there's one argument you could make where you could just say, well, this is just part of the back to Ptolemy movement, and he's following Ptolemy when there's discrepancies based on cultural or religious or, or other motivations. But then there's certainly practitioners or people that follow Lily that would defend him and say, no, he's following those approaches that happen to align with Ptolemy because those are his preferred technical approaches that he feels worked better in practice. Yes, I think that's right. And I don't know that we'll ever know which it was, because there's clearly evidence that he was a very practical and hands-on person. So I don't necessarily see him just taking information as received wisdom. But uh, you're right. It, it is interesting that you know if his, if his experimentation does seem to follow Ptolemy so closely in these certain matters, 
um, you do have to wonder how much of it he is just sort of accepting, um, you know, some of the arguments that he gets from earlier authors. Sure. Yeah. And, and I don't know what the answer is between those. I just wanted to definitely clearly out, outline that there's like two different uh, tr- sort of approaches that people take in their interpretation of what Lily is doing there in different ways that you could view that. And, and like most things, it's probably some sort of mixture between the two. Yes. So let's see, I'm trying to think of any other things in terms of that. Well, well, there were, there was some irony in terms of that, though, just in that Ptolemy, when you go back to the Hellenistic tradition and other authors that Lily didn't have access to, it turns out that Ptolemy sometimes was the outlier because he was a bit of a reformer and was doing things differently than the other astrologers that were his contemporaries, as far as we can tell. And so it's actually from them that the later medieval tradition um, followed some of those practices, like reversing the calculation for the lot of fortune or using the alternative triplicity ruler scheme. So that's one of the ironies of the back to Ptolemy movement and the Renaissance tradition is they were going back to a tradition which um, itself wasn't the mainstream in the era that they were drawing from, evidently. Yes, and I imagine that's often the case when you go back far enough in history is that you don't always know um, maybe until much later, until other texts come to light, whether you're following the mainstream or something a little bit more eccentric. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm sure we'll have that at some point in our, our own time of like, you know, people going back and picking up certain authors and focusing on them. But later, if other authors are discovered and there's like a clearer picture of the broader context in which things are being practiced, or maybe things that we don't know because our vantage point is limited to a certain extent based on just the handful of sources that we have available. That's exactly right. All right. So um, yeah, I want to uh, move on then. So we've talked and we touched on a little bit about Lily's life story very briefly in terms of his involvement in politics and everything else, but maybe we could get a little bit more um, into that and into his background and life story because he's actually unique as one of the first astrologers that I'm aware of who wrote a, a biography or an autobiography about their life, right? That's right. I don't know very many other astrological autobiographies that are earlier than Lily. I mean, obviously, we have a bunch of 20th century ones, but it just it wasn't something that seems to be very common. And often, as you know, details about historical astrologers tend to be quite dim, uh, let alone yeah, a like, book that they wrote themselves. It's like the further back you go, we know less and less about these guys' lives, ex- aside from just the book that they wrote that survives, or sometimes two books. And in some instances, like with Valens, for example, we only know anything about his life through little digressions that he makes um, during the course of writing these books. Or Ptolemy, we only know a little bit about his life based on reconstructing the the four or five texts that he wrote in terms of what his time period would have been. And then you go forward a little bit further, and in the medieval tradition, we start knowing a little bit more about some of these authors. And occasionally we have guys like Abu Mashar, where his um, student Shadan wrote a text like with anecdotes about his teacher. But it's not until we get to the 17th century that suddenly we have an astrologer who was not only extremely prominent and influential, but actually left an autobiography where he went into detail about the background surrounding his story. Yes, that's exactly right. I was thinking about Abu Mashar as well, because that's probably one of the richer biographies we have. And that's sort of, of course, filtered through his students. And we don't know exactly how much of it is legend and how much of it is true. But that's that's about as good as it probably got before, uh, before Lily. Right. So he wrote um, an autobiography, but it was published after his death, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. So he wrote an autobiography uh, quite late in his life, um, encouraged by his friend Elias Ashmole. And we can go a little bit into that. Um, the nice thing about the autobiography is that it's uh, it is available uh, on the internet because it's obviously off copyright, being very old. And there are some new uh, versions of it. There is a nicely edited uh, version by Wade Caves uh, via the Rubedo Press that I would recommend. It's a it's a short little book and it's a it's a good read with a nice introduction. So if you're interested in that, I would definitely pick it up because you kind of get to see the situation and get to see Lily's life and times, really in his own words. Yeah, you can get that. Uh, the title is William Lilly's History of His Life and Times, um, and you can get it on Amazon or from Rubedo. Rubedo.press is the publisher's website. That's right. Okay, so um, 
When was Lily born? We actually have his birth data, right? We do. So he was born new style, uh, May 11, 1602, at 2.07 a.m. with three Pisces rising. And this is according to his own rectification, as well as a chart that was published by Gadbury. There is some debate about whether this chart is true, simply because there were people contemporaneous with Lily who were very afraid of having their charts published because they were worried that their enemies, of course, there were plenty of enemies around at the time because of the political situation, could somehow misuse their chart and somehow cause them problems. But uh, but as far as we know, Lily's chart, it does seem to comport with his life in a number of ways and what we know of him. So we don't really have a strong reason to believe that it's somehow wrong or misleading. Especially if it was published in the autobiography like after the fact, right? That's right. had died. That's okay. right. Got it. So um, how did he grow up or what was his family background? So his background is interesting. Um, like I said... To really be a good astrologer at the time, you had to have a strong command of Latin, which meant that only people who came from very educated backgrounds were able to study astrology thoroughly and properly. And he grew up in a somewhat prosperous peasant family in Lincolnshire, and he received a very strong classical grammar school education, as we would call it, which means that he learned uh, he learned. Latin extremely well, and he seemed to have a bit of a talent for it as well. And with the because this was a strong focus, he thought he was going to be a clergyman. He thought that his father would send him to Oxford, and that he would study for you know to be to be in the church. Now his father lost money as Lily grew up, and so by the time that Lily turned eighteen and his education in Lincolnshire was complete, there was no way that they could send him to university. So instead, he went to work for a family as sort of a secretary and general, all around personal assistant uh, in London. Okay. And for those watching the video version, I wanted to share, I just pulled up the chart. So this is the birth chart, and I set it for alchemicious houses. Is that that's correct, right? Yes, that is that is correct. So he, he primary, his primary house system that he uses all throughout Christian astrology was alchemicious? Mm-hmm. That's exactly correct. Okay. So um, the chart has the ascendance at three degrees of Pisces, according to his rectification. Um, what are some of the other major features of this chart, approaching it from Lily's perspective? So from Lily's perspective, you know, he has three planets in Taurus, Mercury, Venus, and the Sun, with Venus very closely conjunct the Sun. He's got Mars in Virgo on the cusp of the seventh house, and that we can talk about how that may have been reflected <laughs> in a number of aspects of his life. Okay. Uh, Jupiter in Libra in the eighth house, and again, this is using his house system. Uh, Saturn in the ninth house, and the Moon in Capricorn in the eleventh house. So again, very strongly represented among the Earth signs for sure. Right, he's got a lot of Earth signs and Saturn up in Scorpio, at eighteen Scorpio in the ninth house, um, mid heaven in Sagittarius, at like twenty nineteen twenty Sagittarius, and a lot of fortune. Actually, no, using the night chart, um, a reversal calculation. Where is the lot of fortune? I guess it's in Libra if you used his, his non reversed. Methods. That's right. Okay, got it. Uh, which actually you could make an argument for, given his like inheritance played a major role in his life. Exactly. So I, you know, I, I do have this theory, Chris, that sometimes astrologers pick up certain practices because they feel like they work really well in their own charts, and um, and I wonder if that was the case with him as well. You know, where he saw maybe that part of fortune with Jupiter in the eighth, and he did inherit uh, quite a lot of money from his first and second wives. So it it wouldn't be an incorrect interpretation in his case. Right. Yeah, it's just it's tough cuz then it's like the ruler of his ascendant in his 10th house is that Jupiter that's like there as well. Yes. So that's that 8th house is going to be prominent almost no matter no what, matter but what. I could, Yep. I could see why putting the part of fortune there that would even emphasize it more and would that would seem really attractive to him given his life story which we can we can turn back to now. Yes, that's right. All right. So he he was he had like a knack for an aptitude for languages and he studied Latin and Greek in school, right? Yes, that is right. So I think his Latin was definitely the stronger language, although I think he had some Greek as well. And so because of this, um he I think that really put him sort of head and shoulders above many of his contemporaries who practice astrology because they just weren't able to read the texts um as as well as he did. 
So, right. so last we saw him, he was on his way to London and it was sort of an interesting job because like I said, he was sort of a secretary and he was the, the family that, that he was going to work for was quite wealthy. So the man who ran it was very, um, was, was quite wealthy. He lived on rents and Lily says that the man had no profession. So clearly it wasn't that he had any particular skill, but the way that he made his money was that he was a like a household manager, like a chatelaine for some noble families. So I was thinking about this that if you if you ever watch the show Downton Abbey, so this is kind of like Mr. Carson. Um, okay. you know, so this is somebody who's basically in charge of running the entire often massive household and multiple uh, land holdings that the family might have. What was mm-hmm. interesting about this man is that he was illiterate. So he must have been very talented because you think you would need to know to, re- you know, learn to read and write to be able to do some of this work. And Lily, that's why he was his secretary, to help him in those things that the man just couldn't do in running his own household now that the, the older gentleman was retired. Okay. So he, how long did he roughly serve that role for as kind of like an assistant to, or to this guy? So he got there at age 18, and I want to say that he was, was he 27? So he was there nine years, I believe. But there's there's a little bit more complexity to it, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go into it, because it's, a, it's quite an interesting twist. So if you can imagine, so he goes to this house, and there's the man I think he worked for was in his early 60s, mm-hmm. and he had a wife who was a bit older than him. She was, I want to say, late 60s or early 70s, and... Uh, Lily says that the two of them, the husband and wife, just did not get along, even though they were both very nice to him. Um, He still had to work pretty hard. You know, in addition to secretarial work, he says, you know, one day he remembers hauling up like 17 uh, 17 tubs or or giant buckets of water up from the Thames, you know. So he worked, he did a lot of manual labor for them too. But they treated him reasonably well. And he said that the two, the husband and wife, didn't get along because... Lily says that the the wife married the husband for so-called nocturnal society, but the the man did not hold up his part of the bargain up. And as a result, uh, you know, the man was just sort of living off of her money. So the two of them just really didn't get along. And uh, the woman after a while died. She had breast cancer. And Lily, in his autobiography, mentions that he actually assisted in the amputation of her breast as part of that, that treatment. Uh, like after which like she in, like, didn't ca- live care. very long. Yeah. He was actually involved in like caring for her and treating her. He and was, like, yeah. May have start like initiated his interest that became more prominent later in life in like medical astrology or something. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And I'm sure he wasn't very satisfied because she only got worse and she later died. Mm. And so the master remarried. He married somebody uh, younger than himself. She, you know, I, I forget her exact age, but she wasn't young. She would have been like you know, in her fifties. So she wasn't like a girl, but, um, but then, you know, he, he remarried and then the master died and Lily saw his chance and he went to, to his essentially, you know, new boss and said, you know, I would like to marry you. And uh, to perhaps his own surprise, she said, yes. So essentially in the same household, he went from being a servant to being the Lord of the house. And there was this obviously large estate that came with that marriage. Right. And I, in the autobiography, like when I read it, like, cause I, I know there's different interpretations and sometimes people take a cynical view about these things, um, in terms of the financial, like inheritance that he received, he, he got and became much more well off as a result of being in this marriage. But like the way that at least he presents it, um, it comes off, I thought as pretty romantic in the way that he approached her with this, because he, he presents it as like, she's complaining for like a long time about like how she'll never find somebody or something like that and then he says that he's found like the perfect suitor and then he says it's me or something like that like it was actually it sounded very smooth to me and i thought he writes it off as being relatively romantic in the way that it it went down um i don't know what did you think about that am i getting the details right Uh, yeah i think you are for sure and it's hard to know because presumably the only people who were part of that were him and the woman but, you know, I, I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. I mean, maybe to him, he sort of did play this romantic figure um, to this obviously significantly older woman. And uh, but, you know, obviously they both knew that there was also money at stake, but maybe they just, you know, she said, heck, why not? You know, I, she said maybe she wasn't super happy in her previous marriage. And she thought maybe I can marry somebody that seems to like me and treat me reasonably well. So, you know, there is 
people are complex, obviously. Right. So here's the quote from um, his autobiography. He says, uh, this is just part of it, but he says, however, all of her talk was of husbands, and in my presence saying one day after dinner she respected not wealth, but desired an honest man, I made answer, I thought I could fit her with such a husband. She asked me where, and I made no more ado, but presently saluted her and told her myself was the man. <laughs> That's she right. She, she, she replied, I was too young. I said, nay, what I had not in wealth, I would supply in love, and saluted her frequently, which she accepted lovingly. And the next day at dinner, she made me sit down at dinner with my hat on my head and said she intended to make me her husband, for which I gave her many salutes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm going to I'm gonna go with like, that's a romantic like version. And um, I thought that was really interesting. And then this you know, began, they got married, but she, he talks about how they kind of had to keep it, if not completely secret, kind of like on the lowdown because she didn't want um, there to be a bunch of like weird social repercussions or something like that. Yes. I mean, I think it would have been rather unorthodox for a woman of her means to marry a servant, you know, especially with the age difference and all of that. So, and I believe that they did end up in some litigation from family who um, you know, once they found out about the marriage, um, I, maybe that was something she was anticipating. You know, they tried to claw back some of that estate. Okay, got it. Um, so they were married for several years happily, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. And he always speaks very positively of her. So whatever, even if he thought differently, he I think he always uh, referred to her in a very positive light. So we have no reason to think that they didn't get along. Um, so yeah, and so then eventually she she died. It wasn't too long, but during her life, even um, you know, obviously he he didn't have to work anymore. And it sounded like for a couple of years he sort of you know knocked about. He sort of played bowls and you know didn't didn't really do much other than just kind of have fun and, and took a vacation. But right. uh, his his like right. social status is suddenly elevated at that's that right. point. That's right. Social status was suddenly elevated, and he had a lot more free time and presumably disposable income. And, uh, and so, but then he got interested in astrology and this, I think this is probably where things get really interesting in, in my view, just because it's almost like some switch gets flipped and he realizes that there is this whole science, um, that this, this area that he knew not, knew nothing about. And he now had the means to pay somebody to tutor him in astrology, as well as of course, to start buying astrological texts and studying them. Uh, all day and all night, basically for several years. Right, which he could do, and he because he had that background in Latin and to a lesser extent Greek, so he could read texts going back centuries. Um, uh, just because he had the language skills to do so. That's right. That's right. And this is for me one of my favorite parts of the entire book, where he talks about. He sort of doesn't talk about himself a whole lot, but he just talks about a lot of the occultists who were practicing in London at the time. And he doesn't exactly always say what his interaction with them was or his exact relationship, but he will talk about how, for example, they would do different uh, magical experiments together. Lily was deeply interested in, in magic. And don't forget, he was coming out of that, you know, Elizabethan period with John Dee and, and you know, all those, those personages. So he, uh, he and some friends tried to call up a spirit to show them where some treasure was in a church and they got scared away. But there are all these wonderful anecdotes of, of, of magicians practicing in, uh, in London as well as astrologers. And he'll kind of give you his opinion on all of them. Okay. So, and he had um, a, an initial teacher, but this guy, he didn't study with him for very long, right? That's right. And his teacher was, uh, was very interesting because he was one of the kind of what I would call, um, you know, workmen, uh, workmen uh, practitioners of London, who maybe they weren't particularly wealthy or particularly highly educated, but they saw lots and lots of clients. But then Lily at one point saw that uh, the the teacher was giving advice to a woman that he thought was he would have given her other advice if she if she didn't pay him. In other words, he felt that. The, the teacher was in a way sort of prostituting his, his good astrological judgment in the service of making an extra buck. And so at that point, Lily left. Yeah. Right. He thought the teacher gave like an unethical delineation of some sort, and he stopped his interactions with that teacher as a result of thinking that he was unethical. That's exactly right. 
Okay, which is really interesting, and that gives you some insight into Lily himself as like a person and as an astrologer, um, at least in terms of the way that he presents himself, and assuming that that's definitely like the way things went down, just in terms of what his motivation was and how he approached the subject and how much reverence he had for astrology, which then you can kind of see come through in the way that he um, advises the person reading his text and his students to sort of like comport themselves as astrologers um, in some of the rules and the ethical guidelines that he gives. That's exactly right. And that is one of my favorite parts of Christian astrology. And also, I think he alludes to that in, in his autobiography, where he has some sort of practical advice for life and being an astrologer and being out in the world. And as you say, you know, he always advises people to act um, in accordance with sort of virtue and with the highest uh, character. Right. He actually like opens up Christian astrology with a letter to the student that gives a lot of that advice or a lot of those almost like rules of like how to um how to hold yourself as an astrologer and how to behave. That's exactly right. Okay. So he has that teacher. Does he have any other teachers after that, or was there just that first sort of short-lived failed relationship with the one teacher? I think he studied informally or worked. I, I don't know if worked is the right word, but he definitely sort of apprenticed with a number of different astrologers, although I don't know that there was ever a formal relationship kind of like with this one. And the reason I say that I think he got to maybe you know sort of shadow a, a few astrologers is because he seems to know a lot about exactly how they practiced. And sort of, you know, he would occasionally make objections about this one or that one. So to me, there is at least some evidence that he um, he was able to see how they worked on a on a day-to-day -day level. Right. I got the sense reading one of the biographies, I don't know if it was Holden's treatment or the autobiography itself, but there was an allusion to like meetings. So it seems like astrologers were holding meetings of some sort in London, and there were some sort of like social circles so that he probably met directly with and talked with and got to know a bunch of the different practitioners in the city at the time. Yes, exactly. Some things never change. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's in and of itself fascinating as well, because then that is some of the documentation of some of the first, like, you know, quote unquote, uh, astrology groups that you can think of in the world, or at least in the history of what we know about in the history of astrology. That's right. And you wonder, you know, did they have like kind of like we have little presentations or did they was it more informal? They just all got together at the pub. Um, right. You really wonder what that might have looked like. Yeah, it's just something that comes up to me over and over again is so many of the dynamics that we see in the astrological community that are core dynamics in terms of not just the social sphere of astrology, but also how astrologers learn astrology and practice it. So many of those dynamics are probably present in earlier eras in ways that would surprise us if we were fully aware of just the extent to which there were similar themes and similar dynamics. That's right. Even though it must not have been, you know, very well documented, but we can we right. can sort of get little gleanings like this. Sure. Um so he was married to his first wife and that allowed him he suddenly was very well off and he was able to start studying astrology and buying a lot of astrology books and, and starting to build a library. Um, and he eventually, his wife passed away and she left him her entire estate, right? That's exactly right. It said that she left him more than a thousand pounds, which of course at the time was a very, very competent fortune. And there were houses, there was cash. So it was, he was obviously a wealthy man as a result of this marriage. So after this, he decided to, after a few years, he decided to remarry. And, uh, and we can talk about maybe what what uh, planet this wife represented in his chart, because he does tell us in his autobiography. Do you remember, Chris? Yeah, I believe he alludes to being married, uh, the second marriage not going super well, and he uh, attributes it to like Mars being in the seventh house in his birth chart. That's right. He says that my second wife was of the nature of, of Mars. Um, so obviously <sighs> things were not, not super happy in the Lily household while he was married to this woman. Right. Um, yeah. So by this point, do we know when he started practicing astrology based on some of the, like the Horary chart examples? Because a lot of, even though he published Christian astrology in uh, 1647, a lot of the, some of the chart examples go back to like the 1630s or something, right? Yes, that's right. The impression that I get, I don't know, and it may be that people with access to his casebooks um, might know this more closely, but 
he, uh, it doesn't seem like there was much of a lag time between, you know, he studied astrology very intensely, he says, for two years. He just read it, the books day and night. And then he started practicing probably very soon after. So he might have started practicing maybe even before he, uh, before he turned 30 or, or thereabouts. Okay, got it. And um, so he had, he, he gets involved in politics, he publishes Christian astrology, um, becomes very prominent for several decades in ways that we've already talked about, um, not just prominent in politics and with the public at large due to publishing the almanacs and being involved in political predictions and everything else, but also prominent in the astrological community due to the publication of Christian astrology, which must have set him up as like one of the foremost astrologers at the time. Um, although even there, he had some like tensions with other astrologers occasionally, right? I think it's more than just tensions, Chris. Yeah, the okay. it's sort of interesting, you know, when it's it's tempting to say that the Mars in his seventh house um, in Virgo made for some very heated debates in writing often in his life, and uh, it was interesting because that seemed to very much be. Um, his mode of his modus operandi, you know, he would he would get write these long screeds about other astrologers and the the monar the the monarchist cause in print, and then the other astrologers would reply in their publications, and then there would also be um, denunciations from like the pulpit, you know, from from uh, unsympathetic uh, preachers or priests. So there was kind of this whole very public uh, ongoing verbal brawl going on. But it, I have no evidence to see that he didn't enjoy that to some extent because it must have been quite intense at times. Right. So there are different astrologers would often accuse each other of being purely motivated by political reasons rather than astrological reason in, in, in issuing some of their predictions, especially about the Civil War. And so that's what some of the debates and the conflicts with other astrologers were about. But then he also, throughout his autobiography, repeatedly refers to being really annoyed by some of the religious um there's a specific religious group or christian group that he was most annoyed with that he often was on the receiving end of attacks by right mm -hmm. yes that's exactly right um obviously the the presbytery group um who were kind of like the puritans of his time who took over for for a while um definitely did not appreciate um astrologers and you know they're kind of in the movies that are made about that period they're like the non-fun guys that you know shut down theaters and, and anything related to to fun that they thought was immoral. Okay. And astrology, they treat it as like a form of divination that was against the religion. Is that part of the motivation then? Or what is the motivation for him titling his book Christian Astrology? That like was how much my of yeah, that was my impression as well. Now I don't know exactly what whether he thought that was politic and maybe it helped him but I think there is there's definitely, uh, I would say, a consensus today that titling it Christian astrology would perhaps help insulate him from some of the attacks um, from, from the religious quarters. Okay. Yeah, because even just getting a book like that published was a little bit of a dicey venture to begin with. And I've, I've read or I've heard that the introduction where he um, says very many positive things about this well connected political figure that part of that was helping to get it published and that in the revised edition he removes the reference to that person or something like that so there were different like political and cultural wranglings that he had to get through in order to even publish a book like that and that could have been part of that yes very much so you definitely see you know fortunes rise and fall quite rapidly in this period during during the english um, historical you know the civil war so I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, you have a name that gets mentioned in the first vault, in the first printing that is no longer there by the second time. Sure, but but even that being said, he still was certainly a, a religious man to some extent, and he was a Christian and certainly had some religious beliefs um, that he incorporated to some extent in, into his astrology, even though his astrology isn't doesn't otherwise come off as like overtly religious in any notable sense that's different from some of the earlier authors. Yes, I think that's right. And you know, we could speculate that this is a Christian astrology that does not lean too heavily on the um, Muslim authors or or I should say the Middle Eastern authors because in fact very few of them were um, necessarily Muslim, but um but yeah, it's one of the things that you definitely see that he he was genuinely a a believer as I think most of his contemporaries would have been. You don't. I don't think it's necessarily like a cynical ploy for acceptance, but I think he just recognized that 
titling it and making his feelings clear that he is, you know, that he is a Christian um, would make it, as you say, more acceptable and more likely to be published. Right. And that he could be both a Christian and an astrologer, and there wasn't necessarily a conflict between those two in his view. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Um, all right. So later in life, um, does the English Civil War like die down by the time he's later in life, or what's the situation with that? Right. So I don't know if die down is exactly the right term, but over time, people basically became very discontented with the um, with the government of Oliver Cromwell, who took over um, England as the Lord Protector. So they had sort of a republic. Um, and but things aren't, you know, things are not necessarily going well, especially once Cromwell dies. There's a real power struggle, which often happens once you have a powerful figure who who dies. Um, so there is a vacuum, there's a power struggle, and I think people are just really, really tired of of the wranglings of most of that century. And so um, to make a very long story short, uh, the monarchy is restored, and England brings back uh, who be, the, the the man who becomes Charles II from exile in France. And so suddenly, um, after all of these decades um, as a as not a monarchy and or as a questionable monarchy, um, you are now living under a monarch once again. In fact, it's the son of the man who was executed. Wow. So yeah, that's a pretty big change suddenly and potentially put Lily himself on the wrong side of history because he had been more um, against the monarchy than for it in a lot of his political predictions earlier in his life. Yes, that's exactly right. I, I don't know that people necessarily would have expected a restoration of monarchy when the English Civil War was at its height, certainly not after the execution of, of Charles I. Sure. Um, so eventually he ends up like sort of leaving London and sort of retiring to the country in his later years and um, gets more into or moves more towards the practice of medicine? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he ended up getting a medical license from the Archbishop of Canterbury so that he could practice medicine. And he practices it out in the country, uh, obviously using astrology and medicine because they were used jointly at that time, which is a fascinating episode, I suppose, in itself. Um, but he ends up uh, doing this. And uh, probably one of the reasons he left London was just to be out of the public eye a little bit. Again, he was a man with you know a significant estate. And uh, I guess the other thing that happened too, I should probably point out, is that you know his second wife died. I don't know how sad he was about that, given given the unhappiness that that she seems to have brought him. But he uh, he did remarry and he moved to the country with his third wife, who was not wealthy. She was significantly younger, but as far as we know, um, you know, she was a lovely person. And uh, and he says that you know she represented, I believe it was Jupiter in his chart. Mm, wow. Okay. Um, and he's practicing medicine in terms of helping people, and a lot of that work was not necessarily paid work, but he was like working with the poor and doing like volunteer services to some extent. Exactly. Presumably he had no need of extra money. Maybe his expenses were relatively low now that he was out of the big city. So um, I think he just wanted to do kind of the charitable thing and and live a, a quieter life maybe than he had earlier. Sure. Um, and eventually, very late in life, his eyesight starts to fail um, and he dictated for the past last few years of his almanac, he dictated it to his his assistant or his protege, Henry Coley, mm -hmm. I think I read. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, and at this point in his life, he also became good friends with Elias Ashmole, who um, who was sort of an interesting person in himself. And again, that's, that's probably a whole different episode because he was also a very colorful figure from that period. But Elias Ashmole was a royalist. And But nonetheless, he and Lily were great friends, and Elias had a great interest in, in magic, in alchemy, certainly astrology, and he had a massive library of his own. And when the restoration occurred, um, Ashmole received some very lucrative royal appointments. So he was already a fairly prominent man, but then he became quite wealthy. And he was the person who encouraged Lily to write his autobiography, which I assume it wasn't entirely Lily's idea, but Ashmole sort of nudged him to do that. Okay, wow. And um, Ashmole would go out to the country and visit Lily pretty frequently later in life? Yes, that's exactly right. So I'm sure they their ideas and discussions cross-pollinated quite a bit. So eventually, um, Lily passed away. Mm -hmm. um, he died in the year, sorry, what year was it? 1681? That's right. 
1681, he died at the age of 79. Um, yes, he did. And his library, which must have been quite extensive, uh, Ashmole bought it from Lily's widow, along with the, the famous oil portrait of Lily and uh, some medals that Lily had received from King Gustav of Sweden. Um, he bought it from the widow for, for 50 pounds. So that became part of Ashmole's estate. And so once he died, his holdings got donated to Oxford University, where today they are in the so-called Ashmolean Museum. And so his case, so Lily's case books are also part of this. So his books, his portrait is there, his case books are there, um, all thanks to this friend who was a great collector and who, who eventually donated everything to charity or to, to Oxford as well. Wow, that's really wild. And then um, Ashmole, of course, brought to publication Lily's autobiography a number of years after his death. Eventually, yes, that's exactly right. So he did it. He did that much later. Um, I don't know exactly what the delay was, whether it was sort of politically motivated or practically, or what the issue was. But yes, it, it wasn't. It wasn't published during Lily's lifetime. Sure, and that was probably he was able to be much more open and like honest about some of the different things that happened, especially politically by having it published after his death rather than when he was still alive? Potentially, yes. I mean, obviously it was written, you know, when he didn't know when it was, I, I don't know if they had planned to publish it immediately or after his death. I guess I should, I should say that. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So after Lily's death, I mean, astrology was already in decline in Europe in general, in the continent by that point. And so that's one of the things that's really interesting and unique and kind of w weird about Lily is this was kind of like historians usually treat this as the last great flourishing of astrology that occurred in the 17th century before the subject kind of fell um, out of favor in intellectual circles in general and, and fell out of the universities and sort of went into a low point of, of a couple of centuries. Yes, that's exactly right. What's interesting about Christian astrology is that in one form or another, it was pretty much never out of print. And so just tracing the book, the book's fate after Lily's death is sort of a fascinating study in itself, and the influence that it had had directly and indirectly on the astrology as it was practiced, even through some of these less, um, I should say, less active times. Right. So even though astrology goes into a low point for a couple of centuries, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries after Lily's death, um, his book uh, continues to be highly influential and continues to show up in different places and influencing some of the astrologers who uh, did exist and who did make major contributions during those those low periods for two centuries. And then eventually there was a, a version of it where it was like republished, and this is known as the Zadkiel edition, um, was published in 1835. And this was like an abridgment and like a, a rewriting of Christian astrology, right? Yes, that's exactly right. So it's, you know, Zadkiel took Lily's book um, and then he kind of rewrote it. He, you know, he changed some things. He took some things out. So you're, you're getting Lily, but through a pretty heavy filter, I would say, through a pretty heavy editorial process. And, uh, and then so it came out again in 1852 when he combined it in an edition with some other works. And this later edition, this combined edition, continued to be republished into the 1980s. So it was the, the real challenge historically since, uh, since Lily's time wasn't to get a hold of Lily. It was really to get a hold of Lily in his own words, in his own book. Okay. So Lily continued to be influential, but it was like filtered through this abridged, like edited edition where because it's not just an abridgment, but like I think he throws in like Uranus and stuff like that, or like he started to incorporate like changes that were already happening to astrology that makes it different than what Lily had written in the mid seventeenth century. Exactly, I think Zadkiel sort of takes it and he's like, well, you know, I think this needs to be updated for modern times, and you know, yeah. I'm sure he thought he was doing a good thing, and in a way, he was. I mean, I think I would much rather have Lily's work be republished, even if it's dramatically changed, so that. Perhaps as it happened, people become interested in the original. It's much better, I think, than it you know disappears completely. But yes, I think that was the intent. Yeah, because there was like a, a limited number of copies that were printed of the original versions of Christian astrology of like the first and second edition, and those just were not in wide circulation. And as time went on, became increasingly um, scarce or increasingly more valuable, but also just not available to like the everyday astrologers, so that you couldn't 
read Lily's original work. So having it republished in this abridged form was something that was probably useful in propagating Lily's work over the next couple of centuries. That's right, making it more affordable and available. Sure. So eventually, though, that changed, and I actually reco- uh, covered this in a recent episode uh, just a couple of months ago when I interviewed Clive Cavan from uh, the Regulus Publishing Limited in episode 212, where he talked about in the mid-1980s when he and a few other astrologers got together in order to uh, republish the original version of Christian astrology, which was even more scarce by the 1980s and just nobody had access to. And suddenly, by republishing it, um, astrologers for the first time in a few centuries had a widely accessible um, edition of Lily that they could read in its original language. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly right, which that was revolutionary. I mean, it really did take, you know, over 300 years for us to come full circle. Right. Yeah, so that's such a, a long time. So um, after that point, so that started kind of a renaissance in the 1980s of um, focus and interest in Lily, and suddenly astrologers going back and reviving his methods, and especially reviving his approach to horary astrology. Right. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, you know, and and I don't want to go too far afield here, but horary astrology did continue to be practiced between Lily's time and ours. But it did take on a somewhat different character as people incorporated outer planets, but also as they just used things, they used houses differently. And you had uh, people who were sort of innovating in the field. Um, I've Obviously, Ivy Goldstein Jacobson is one person who comes to mind, although she's definitely not the only one. So Horary was taking a very different direction. And so when um, when this book was published, when Lily became available in his own words again, people started to reevaluate Horary and started to, as you say, use some of his methods, which were perhaps different from what had evolved uh, through the 20th century to that point. Right. And even Horary had become less prominent. Like Natal was much more prominent through in most of the 20th century and much more popular. And Horary was sometimes looked down upon or even oh, scorned. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think often you're definitely right about that. And part of that, Chris, is, you know, you know, as we all know, the the stringent anti fortune telling laws of the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries were very much anti prediction, and so no astrologer wanted to land in jail. So that's one of the reasons that Horary um, was just not particularly um, politic and particularly um, good to use, certainly publicly. You know, perhaps you had folks who were using it um, for themselves or for friends, but as as a as a real kind of public thing that you would teach and that you would publicly espouse, it was it was very much, um, uh, I don't want to say forgotten, but not used very often. Sure. Yeah, because natal astrology, astrologers have sometimes been able to kind of like rationalize that and contextualize it as like a natural almost science or, or, or contextualize it in the early 20th century as like character analysis or something like that, or later as psychological analysis. But with horary, it's just much more clear that you're making specific, often very concrete statements about the future, and therefore it comes off much more like a form of divination, which is harder to sort of justify in a purely like naturalistic context. Exactly. And you know, I don't want to say it was just the anti-fortune telling laws, but I think that was definitely a key reason why people moved away from prediction. And then you know, once you get into um, you know the, the Freudian and Jungian eras, people really sort of start you know, thinking of psychology as, as kind of the, the real reason that we need to be using astrology at all. So it while again, Horary still had a few adherents, it was quite a different practice than I think when the Lily revival occurred. Sure. So we have the republication of the Regulus edition of, of, of Lily in 1985. And I believe for that edition, they had a few different copies of Lily and um, they seem to have like merged in some instances. Like my understanding was that they kind of created a merged edition of the first and second edition. Uh, they'd incorporated incorporated some of the corrections from the second edition in to create a yeah basically a merged edition of those two, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. And so it you know every every edition, uh, every modern edition sort of took a different approach. And so it's always worthwhile seeing kind of what editorial decisions they made since they are dealing with two publications of that book. Which edition will they use? Or again, as you say, do they merge them? Um, 
more modern uh, editions, if I may jump forward, like by Dave Roll, uh, he wants to, you know, he modernizes the spelling, for example, which is, um, which is obviously 17th century uh, spelling that Lily would have used. Right. So um, the, the Regulus edition comes out in the mid 80s, and this causes a renaissance of interest in Lily. And um, there's some teachers, um, especially Olivia Barclay, who sets up a correspondence course for learning horary astrology um, following Lily's methods. And this is uh, the certification that she starts offering is known as the Qualifying Horary Practitioners Certification, right? Am I getting that right? Yes, I think that's right, the QHP. Mm -hmm. QHP, okay. And she ends up teaching and certifying a, a sort of generation of astrologers who then go on and start setting up practice themselves and practicing horary and writing articles about it. And there's this flourishing of like scholarship and textual analysis that's very much focused on Lily, but also increasingly on the broader community of astrologers from the 17th century as they start reviving other texts from that time period, like William Ramsey and John Partridge and Gadbury and everybody else. That's right. Yes. For example, so again, I studied with John Frawley, who was one of uh, Olivia's students. And a big part of our study was not just Lily, but for example, Nicholas Culpepper. So when you're studying medical astrology, you would go to his text, um, you know, in addition to whatever Lily might have to say about judging medical charts, for example. Right. And so this is the first wave of what now we look at as the, the revival of traditional astrology, which was possible because this was basically going back to the very earliest um, texts that you can read without having any specialized language skills and needing to know like Latin or Greek or Arabic or what have you, but you could actually pick up, you know, like the reprinted version of Lily and read it in English, even though the language is somewhat removed from our own. And sometimes there's ambiguities about what he means because certain words have changed or like fallen out of usage. You can more or less sort of like get by reading the text in English. Yes, that's right. And um, it, you know, I, I often wonder to what extent Lily's text was sort of the gateway text where people started thinking, hey, you know, maybe we should really start translating and republishing a lot of older texts that maybe weren't in English to begin with. Would you say that that was the case? Um, yeah, I, I would. There's like a debate about that just because there's sort of squabbling about it. But I think Rob Hand, for example, was definitely influenced by. Um, what was happening with the revival of Lily, and that's part of what prompted him to start looking into old sources so that he was more open to uh, eventually in the 90s when he got together with Schmidt and Zoller, um, they, he was more open to collaborating and going in that direction. So I think that definitely influenced Project Hindsight to that extent. But then I know some of them, there was some interesting stuff where they didn't feel like um, when they started publishing Greek, like Hellenistic and medieval translations, they didn't feel like a lot of the people that had gotten interested in Lily were as interested in that older material than they expected, so that there were some tensions there. Once the full tradition or all of the traditions were revived, there started being um, almost like different camps of people that were into different forms of traditional astrology, which were not always necessarily like perfectly overlapping or like one and the same. That's right. No, right. Do you like new traditional astrology, old traditional astrology? Right. Different. Right. Different Just flavors. because every time astrology was transmitted, um, it, changed it changed in different ways. That's right. Yeah. And I, I agree. And, and I think that's one of the interesting things. So you could say in a way, at least in some cases, Lily was influential twice, right? He was influential for his writings, but then also in sparking this real return, at least as you say, for some astrologers, a real return to some of even Lily's sources, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that was huge. And then, so you get this whole generation of astrologers. And one of the things that's interesting about, even though Lily is Christian astrology is written in English, um, because it's you know English from several centuries ago, there is still sometimes some ambiguity in the wording that requires like some interpretation, or where there's some passages that are open to interpretation. And it was interesting seeing that. In the decade after the revival of Lily, sometimes there were um, arguments over textual analysis about how to interpret what Lily was doing or interpret certain passages of Lily, especially when there was a conflict. Um, so, for example, one of the conflicts was the considerations before judgment, where some of the students of Lily in the 1990s noticed that 
Um, he, he mentions the considerations before judgment and outlines that in like book one in the introductory text. But when he gets to the chart examples, he has charts where the considerations are there, but he still judges the question. And so there were different stu students of Olivia's who came up with different interpretations of how to reconcile that apparent conflict in the text. Yes, I think that's that's a very interesting point and a great example of some of the inconsistencies in his text. So I think I would actually say there are two, well, lots of ways, but there are two key ways in which Lily's text can be ambiguous. One is what you alluded to, which is where he just might say something, but it's not clear what he means. And I don't know how much of that is always language. I think it's just honestly just imprecise writing, because even mm. though he was a pretty educated man, he wasn't a scholar. You know, this was obviously the first book of his kind, of its kind. And so there are times when what he writes could be interpreted in different ways. And so obviously that sometimes gives rise to confusion. But the second way as well as what you pointed out is once you have examples, people start looking at what you do instead of what you say. And the considerations right. before judgment is a great example of that where he seems to ignore them, although you know maybe he'll mention it, but it certainly didn't seem to stop him from judging charts. Um, also, when you look at his case books, that's again the case. Sure. So let's talk about that because it's a great and interesting example that in the recovery of this text that there were sometimes in the people that recovered it like wildly different interpretations of what to do then based on what you were reading in the text. So there was one school of people, especially earlier in the 20th century, that were still using some rules from Lilly um, based on like the Zadkiel edition. And the way that they interpreted the considerations before judgment is that if any of these placements are um, in a horary chart, that it means you you shouldn't judge the chart at all and you should just forget about it and like walk away. And that's like one interpretation of Lily's considerations before judgment, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And that's it's um it's it's a view that seems to have had a lot of currency just from what I can tell in the 80s and 90s. Mm. And uh, where it was kind of like if you it, it was never really explained sort of why you should walk away, but there was this like the chart is telling you do not judge me. And so I see that a lot less in the last say 20 years, but there was definitely a period where um, as you say, people interpreted those those um, those judgments or those considerations very stringently. Right, and then there was like another group who interpreted them as um, that these were just rules. I think, like for example, John Frawley, one of your teachers, said that um, his his way to reconcile this was just like if these are present in a chart, these are just rules that astrologers came up with to get out of answering questions that they don't want to answer, and that it wasn't a legitimate astrological techniques so much as, as it was almost like a social way for an astrologer to avoid answering certain questions if they choose to or something like right. that. Right. And that, you know, obviously you certainly could use them that way. And I think that's the other extreme. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case either, just because we do see these transmitted through a number of texts. Obviously, Bonatti, you know, makes, uh, you know, he devotes a fair amount of time to the to the considerations. Um, yeah, so that is that is another uh, option. There's also a third option, but maybe you were getting to that. Yeah, I, well, I just wanted to outline what mm -hmm. his, because I also always historically like strongly objected to that interpretation mm -hmm. because I thought that these were legitimate they had astrological. A yeah, yeah, they, they had a purpose, and then astrologers didn't need to like transmit these rules over hundreds of years. Um, in order to just get out of answering questions, that's almost seemed like a weirdly negative interpretation of attributing false, you know, premises to bad the astrologers. Faith. Right. Right. Yeah, bad faith. Yeah. Um, so another interpretation that some of the other students of Olivia took were just that these were things that you were supposed to take into account that could give you additional information about the chart that you were um, judging, and that you were supposed to they were supposed to like give you pause. But not necessarily mean that you couldn't answer the question at all, and that's why Lily continued to still judge uh, charts that contained the considerations. Yes, um, I and I think that's I don't know if that's the the closest one. I'm certainly the closest to that view, although maybe mine is like item three B rather than that exact um, definition. But I think in general, um, you know, the considerations certainly do seem to. And just now, I'm speaking as a horary practitioner, and also based on what we see in in Lily's uh, charts they do seem to have descriptive power. So mm -hmm. it's not so much that they're strictures, which is, I think, a term that Barbara Waters had used. But 
Um, they are things that I would tell you are, are sort of metadata about a chart. So they might tell you, you know, is the person asking a question before they've really given it a lot of thought or did a lot of research as to the feasibility of, of the issue, for example. It doesn't mean you right. can't answer the question, but it does tell you a little bit about where the person is coming from and, um, you know, how, how you could perhaps couch your answer. Right. Or there's the other one of like Saturn in the first house and that there might be a problem with the person asking the question or Saturn in the seventh house. And since the seventh house represents the astrologer in a horary question, that there might be a problem on the astrologer's side, either with your judgment or maybe you calculated the chart wrong or something like that. Exactly. So I think it, they can convey valuable information that may or may not necessarily stop you from judging the chart, which obviously would be your decision. Sure. Um, so, but it's just interesting historically that there were those debates and this discussion that that came up surrounding Lily and the recovery of this text, where even a text written in English is still open to interpretation. Sometimes, when you run into issues that uh, appear to represent like discrepancies that need to be reconciled, that's absolutely right. There, are, there are a number of of questions and discrepancies, and again. Part of it is a is a is the function of the fact that he's got all these examples in his book. Um, one of the reasons we don't run into this always with older authors is because there are no examples or no real sort of you know difficult examples like this. So maybe if we had those, those authors too would be subject of of the uh, intense disputes that Lily seems to engender in some cases. Right, definitely. Or um, another one is the interpretation of what does it mean for the moon to be void of course. And different interpretations that have like sprung out over that, it seems like over the past 20 or 30 years. That's right. I mean, if you want to see astrologers uh, express some very strongly held opinions, just mention the void of course definition and, and you'll definitely get something like that. Right. Okay. Well, we'll leave that one for another episode or another discussion. Right. Um, so, what were some of the later editions? So, we had the Regulus edition, which came out in 1985, but then there's been other. Um, editions of Lily where, where astrologers have tried to republish the original text since then, right? That's right. So there was the Ballantry reprint, um, Renaissance Astrology, which is Christopher Warnock, uh, put out a reprint as well. Uh, Justus Associus put one out. And then again, the one I mentioned by Dave Roll, the Astrology Classics edition, which I believe is the most recent among all those. Yeah. And then there was also in 1999, the Acela edition, That's right. uh, which was published by Deborah Holding. That's right. And that's actually my favorite edition. Um, I it's like out of print, but I lucked out and I picked it up in a used bookstore at the Magus Bookstore in Seattle in like nineteen in two thousand seven. Um, and I wish that that edition was still in circulation, but I think the company associated with Acela went out of business or something like that. Yes, that's right. As you as I'm sure you know, astrological uh, publishers you know blink in and out of existence pretty rapidly. Right. So. Um, that edition was in 1999, but it's very scarce. And so at the present time, I believe the most widely accessible, or let's say easily accessible print edition is the Astrology Classics edition that was published by David Rowell in two volumes. And like volume one contains books one and two, and volume two contains book three, which is just on natal astrology. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And what was your proviso with his translation that it's okay, but he's updated the spelling or That's the language right. or something? That's right. And you know he's done a lot of good. So one thing that is nice is he um, preserved the pagination, so that okay. um, you know if you're talking to other Lily enthusiasts, you can talk about the same page number without obviously having to change that based on edition. Um, but he also he did update the spelling in a lot of cases, and I have a. I have a facsimile of the um, the first, uh, the 1647 edition, and so I compared some of the the language between the two. And now I will say I have not done a full line by line comparison between the two books. So as far as I know, David did not make um, substantive textual changes, but he definitely updated the spelling to modern uh, spelling instead of kind of the more uh, the more exotic to us 17th century English spelling. Okay, got it. So, and here's those two volumes. They look like that, and they're relatively cheap. You can get them on Amazon, but otherwise, there's PDFs of the original edition that you can get online. I'm sure, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, I think Skyscript has 
a, a version with like extensive commentary in a PDF, and that's probably got to be one of the best that's online. But I'm not sure if that's been completed at this point. It I don't believe be it parts. is complete, um, Chris. I you know the the version that I have, which is the the 1647 version that came from Philip Graves' scans of the original book. So it's okay. very you know it's very clear. Obviously, it's in PDF form, but that's what I use. Do you remember what the URL is for Philip's site? It's astrolearn.com. Okay, great. So people should check out astrolearn.com and you can find the PDF probably there, which he either has for free or he might have for sale. I at think this it's point. for sale. The way that I got it, as far as I know, unless Philip changed it, it was part of a DVD called, I want to say it's called From Lily to Partridge. And it's got a okay. number of texts on it from that time that Philip owns and that he has scanned as, as very high quality PDFs. Right. I just remember I've been trying to get him to convert that to like digital downloads instead of a DVD at this point, and he's still in the process of doing that. So I'll see if I can talk to him to get at least where he could sell the PDF of Lily sometime soon so I can link to it on the description page that for this really episode. Nice. Yes. Okay, good. Um let's see. Other sources for Lily. There's different modern treatments, of course. One of the main sources is his autobiography. Um and the you know, you can get that in different places online as well, I believe, right? That's right. So, you know, I just Google it, so I don't have a great website for it, but I'm sure if you could put a link up on, on the show notes and do that. But that's freely available. Okay. Otherwise, there's a really excellent edition um, that Wade Caves did just a few years ago um, through Rubedo Press. Yes. And I recommend that. It's a very nice book. It's a good way to support astrological publishers, obviously. You know, and it's it's footnoted, and it's a, it's a nice guide if this is your first foray into the world of Lily. Yeah, so you can get that on Amazon. It, the title is just William Lily's History of His Life and Times from the year 1602 to 1681, and it has a bunch of great footnotes as well as very nice layout and design that makes for easy reading compared to reading like a scan of the original text. Yes, that's exactly right. Other than that, other treatments of Lily. Um, I read and I really love because I'd read pieces of it, but it was only recently that I sat down and read the full thing. Where it turns out that James Holden did his master's thesis in 1953 on William Lilly, and it's just this really excellent, clear treatment of Lilly's life and his work in Christian astrology, as well as some of his political wranglings in about like a, like 100 pages or 150 pages or something like that. And it's amazing how much of Holden's style from his later works that were all published in like the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, how much you can already see his voice at that point much earlier in his life in 1953. Yes. And the other thing that's amazing to me, Chris, is just the fact that James Holden was so ahead of his time in recognizing Lily's importance, right? These are right, the 50s when nobody was really talking about Lily. Yeah, it's literally 30 years before the Regulus edition came out, and before there was that huge flourishing of astrology, we have this lone astrologer who's getting a classics degree, and he did all this amazing work on Lily. And what was interesting is, like, if you read it, he didn't even have the text itself. He was working from like microfilms and just like reading the text through those those reproductions. Yes, yes, um, yeah. James Holden is is a fascinating man, and I, I, you know, when I had the opportunity to speak with him about ten years ago now. Uh, we talked a little bit about his journey to astrology, but it's still amazing to me that he so early in life was able to identify the importance of Lily and, as you say, put a lot of effort into into studying Lily's work. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm really grateful you did one of the only, I think, biographical interviews on Holden that anybody ever did and published it on your, your website or on your blog. And that's a really important like historical document at this point because nobody else was able to interview him to get the the background to what is actually a really interesting story about one of the most notable astrological historians of the past century. Yes, and I mean it wasn't for lack of access. He was, I think, a very gracious person. But I think people just weren't really um, thinking of of James Holden as as the uh, the force behind so many of these translations. Yeah, um, and so much because he did that that sort of thesis on Lily in 1953, but then he went on to, I think, work as like an electrician or something, and he just did translations on the side in his spare time and researched the history of astrology in his spare time. 
and most of those translations wouldn't actually be published and towards the very end of his life like 40 or 50 years later exactly yes he was um he was a phone engineer for the state of texas as he told me so that was his uh, that was his professional life and he said he would just come home every day and, and translate a few pages so you know, in some ways, like I said, he seemed to have a real love for for the classics, and and Lily was very much a part of that as well. Right. So that's amazing. And that master's thesis, I don't know if it's like publicly available anywhere. If it's not, like I may just post a link to it on the Astrology Podcast website um, because it should be out there because it's a really fascinating read and is really useful as like an objective treatment of Lily's life and biography. Yeah, I would appreciate that. As far as I know, Chris, and again, maybe you were able to find it elsewhere, but as far as I know that, you know, it's just his, um, his, his university in Texas has a copy of his thesis. Um, I don't know that they digitized it. So if you, if there is a version that you know of or can post, I think that would be, it would be a great service. Okay. I'll see if I can link to that on the description page for this episode on the Astrology Podcast website. Um, other than that, uh, there was another book on Lily that came out a few years ago, which was um, titled The Man Who Saw the Future by Catherine Blackledge, and that's kind of like a biography of Lily. Um, it seemed to be endorsed by a number of people. I've only read part of it. Is that a good source for like reading Lily's life? I think so. It's certainly a good source. Um, I The part that I, I wasn't sure about is I don't know to what extent um, Catherine Blackledge was able to get some of the primary sources again. Lily's casebooks would be one, but it's a very readable book, and it's just it's another way to approach Lily if you don't want to read, um, you know, a 17th century text um, in the form of his autobiography right away. Sure. Yeah, it's good to sometimes like work up to those things. Yeah. Maybe. Yep. Yeah. And then there was also a treatment by Derek Parker in 1975 titled "Familiar to All," but that's sometimes a controversial account of Lily. Right, and it, it's it's not so much that it's deeply wrong. I, th I think there are some inaccuracies, but that's not the concern. I think it's more that it's unsympathetic. As you had alluded to earlier, a lot of 20th century astrologers, or at least some, I would say, um, had a very negative view of Horary and therefore of Lily because they saw it as kind of just like cheap fortune telling. And uh, and so that seems to be the, the tack that Derek Parker took as well. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, luckily, we have so many other treatments at this point that that's not the only treatment that people have to read. Um, is there any other, as we're getting towards the end of this and winding down, are there any points about Lily and his work that we should have touched on and haven't or that we're, we're spacing out at this point? I think we covered everything pretty thoroughly, Chris, although I'm sure I'll think of five different things once we finish the podcast. I think we're, right. I think we're pretty good. Okay, well, maybe we can do a follow-up episode at some point to talk about some of those different things. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I've been wanting to do this episode forever, and I've been thinking about it for a few years, but wasn't sure how to approach it. And I'm really glad that um, we got a chance to collaborate on this today. So yeah, thanks for all of your- My pleasure, Chris. Yeah, so what are you working on? Or last time I saw you on the podcast was a few years ago, and you were doing the work on Bonatti's considerations, um, but you've been- working on not just that, but other things lately as well, right? Yes, yes. So I guess like Lily himself, to some extent, I do have an interest in astrology and magic. And so I pursue both of those interests. And, you know, a big focus of my work is traditional astrological magic, um, which, you know, in a way that would have been practiced by Lily's and his, Lily and his contemporaries, but also probably the people uh, preceding him, as far as we know. Um, so to that end, you know, I publish a monthly magical elections document, which is, it's essentially a document that um, you can get it at ninagriffin.com, which is my site. And it guides magicians to the best times to do their rituals in the upcoming months. So it's a, it's something that is is a fairly niche product, but it's, it's interesting for those who like to find that intersection between magic and astrology. Um, I do also have a class on astrological magic coming up at Kepler College online starting October 19th. That's 2019, if you're listening to this later. And uh, you can always find me on my site, minagriffin.com. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, all of the, the major platforms. Brilliant. And you said your website is ninagriffin.com? Yes, that's right. Excellent. And the Kepler class, uh, people can find out more information about it, kepler.edu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I guess that's it for this episode. Uh, thanks to all the patrons and to the sponsors who helped to support the production of this episode by signing up through our page on patreon.com. Um, specifically, I wanted to give a shout out to 
patrons Christine Stone, uh, Nate Craddock, as well as the Astro Gold Astrology app, which is available at astrogold.io, and the Portland School of Astrology, which is available at portlandastrology.org. Uh, so thanks for supporting the production of the podcast. And I guess that's it for episode 221 of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks everybody for watching or listening to this episode, and we will see you again next time. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thanks.